think we can start. It's uh, 10.01. Attendees are still um, joining in, but um, I think we can start. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, this is the Foreign Policy Institute of SAIS Johns Hopkins. Welcome. My name is Yulia Joja. I am a fellow here at SAIS, um, the Foreign Policy Institute um, of SAIS. Welcome to our discussion, everyone, on the geopolitics of energy. I am privileged today um, to be joined by a number of esteemed colleagues from um, both the United States and Europe to discuss the implications of nuclear energy projects um, for Western um, security. And I am joined today by um, Albina Sananavicius, um, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania. Welcome. Um, Charles Doran, um, Andrew Mellon, Professor of International Relations and the Director um, of the Global Theory and History Program and of Canadian Studies here at um, Johns Hopkins. Um, size uh, by um, Giselle Donnelly, Resident Fellow for Defense and National Security of the American Enterprise Institute. And um, last but certainly not least, um, Benjamin Schmidt, um, Postdoctoral Research Fellow at Harvard University. I would also like, before we start um, the discussion, to um, thank um, SAIS and uh, the Foreign Policy Institute for hosting our discussion today. Um, the plan was to do it in person in March. Unfortunately, the pandemic um, um, canceled that. But on the other side, um, we are excited today that we can be joined by um, both uh, participants from DC as well as from all over the world. So um, we look forward to a fruitful discussion involving all of you. Um, we would like to structure the discussion today so that um, we plan two rounds of quick interventions um, of each one of our panelists to be able then to open up the discussion for your questions. Um, please, when you have questions to our participants, um, send them to our Q&A and um, we will have um, a look and I will try to weave as many questions uh, into the discussions as, as we can from, uh, from all of you. Um, and um, last but not least, I would like to thank um, Zivile from SIPA, who started this initiative around her paper last year um, on the Astraviets uh, nuclear plant. Um, and I invite you to read it all um, as, as background if you're interested in, in uh, further digging into the topic, um, as well as the Lithuanian Embassy here in DC, who has been so helpful and um, supportive of organizing this and helping us. Um, so to start the discussion, um, the nuclear energy market um, today, as we're looking at it, uh, is becoming increasingly dominated by the state-owned companies of Russia and China. Nearly two-thirds of the new, uh, new reactors under construction worldwide are using designs from China and Russia. And this development has heightened concerns about a weakening of nuclear governance standards all over the world, as well as potential political, economic, as well as international security implications for the United States, Europe and its allies. Um, today we look forward to discussing the broader issues of geopolitics in the nuclear energy industry, examine the case study of the, uh, of the Russian-built Astraviets nuclear power plant in Belarus at the border with Lithuania, and discuss the, um, United, what the United States, together with its friends and allies, um, could do to mitigate the growing dominance of Russian and Chinese nuclear energy experts. Um, and I would like to start the discussion today um, with um, Albinas. Um, can you offer us a quick introduction into the problem of Astraviets um, for um, regional security? Sure, thank you very much and, and good morning to everyone. Well, really, you posed some very pertinent questions and uh, we have seen for past several decades that Western nuclear energy companies which operate largely in a free market environment had been badly losing the nuclear energy export race and they've been losing that to Chinese and Russian state-owned enterprises and the question is how much this is due to government support both providing financial resources but also pushing foreign countries to accept nuclear projects in the case of Astraviet's nuclear power plant, as you mentioned it rightly, Russia provides 
100% state-backed credits for the constructions, seemingly providing that plant for free, and the credit is repairable only when plant is operational. So these are really conditions you can hardly see in real life in the free market economy. It is also a fact that for Belarus, it would be extremely difficult to re refuse offer from Russia to build that nuclear power plant. And your second question, how this whole situation affects global nuclear governance? Well, in the case of Astrovets, we see only negative implications. The project is plagued by scores of safety problems and in violation of numerous international conventions. On top of that, the construction of power plant has so far been pretty hellish experience as to date there were more than 10 publicly announced incidents on building site. And when we try to attract attention of, for example, International Atomic Energy Agency, they claim that nuclear safety is a national responsibility. And furthermore, Recently, EU reg nuclear regulators conducted a stress test in the plant and discovered major deficiencies. Today, instead of addressing real issues, Belarus has started information campaign on social media full of fake news about the safety of the plant. Therefore, we can't ever stress enough how important it is to ensure adequate nuclear safety and not only for the sake of host country, but also for the sake of its neighbors. And the third question is how implementation of nuclear energy and other projects in the area of strategic infrastructure establishes long-term dependency of a recipient country. Now for quite some time, there has been a debate on whether foreign built nuclear power plants just like any other strategic infrastructure, could be considered as something more than just investment. While at times the truth is difficult to establish, in the case of Astrovets, we have several pressing examples. There is an overwhelming evidence that Russian-built nuclear power plant in Astrovets is anything but a harmless commercial venture. First, the contrary to what is claimed by Belarusian government, the power plant will not help Belarus to diversify its energy imports. Instead of buying more Russian gas, Belarus will simply buy nuclear fuel from Russia and will solely uh, rely on Russian expertise in the nuclear field. Second, there is neither internal demand for additional electricity in Belarus nor there is any viable option to export electricity abroad. In fact, back in 2018, the Belarusian president openly admitted that his ministers have not been able to present a convincing concept for the utilization of the nuclear power plant. Therefore, considering that Astrovets makes no economic sense and that it is being built haphazardly and in violation of international agreements, it leads us to conclusion that the project is most definitely driven by Russian geopolitical considerations. Astrovets will not only further erode Belarusian sovereignty and push it closer towards the so-called Union state with Russia, but could also provide Moscow with the means to complicate Lithuanians and, Lithuanians and other Baltic countries' energy independence from Russia. And finally, yet, Importantly, project creates long-term irritant in the bilateral relations between Lithuania and Belarus. Therefore, we believe that project is dangerous. It runs counter to Lithuania's and Belarus' interests. It should be abandoned or at least suspended until all important security and economic issues are resolved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now let me turn to um, Charles. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the general risks for both the region and international security in the case of um, such um, projects of nuclear plants? Um, you have to unmute yourself, please. Don't forget. Uh, there's no doubt that there are serious uh, risks associated with this. You know, there, it's, this project is filled with paradoxes. Uh, one of them is that Belarus, in fact, 
had been uh, very much negatively affected by Chernobyl. And there were uh, people, lots of people had to uh, uh, leave uh, areas and so on. Uh, and now, of course, this project is, uh, is uh, being set up. Um, I saw a recent study which said that in the last uh, six, about 60 years, there were over 90 uh, accidents of all sorts uh, that led to loss of life and destruction of property and so on. But the real problem is highlighted by uh, Chernobyl and uh, by Fukushima. And that is, if you have a major, a major accident, the difficulty is it isn't just the short-term effect, it's the long-term effect. It destroys uh, uh, the, the pristine countryside, certainly around where this plant is located, but, but also uh, the, the landscape of, of neighbors. Uh, so I don't think it's by accident that both uh, the Lithuanian and, and German governments are uh, opposed to this. But their paradoxes are much deeper. Siemens, a German company, is providing some of the technology for this. Um, it is uh, also the case, I will bet, that down the road, Lithuanian interests will end up importing some cheap electricity. Uh, so I, I think uh, this thing is, is very, very complicated. There is no doubt, i just conclude on this, there is no doubt in my mind that this is a, a model of neo-mercantilism in which the state picks out um, an industry and supports it, uh, undermines the uh, competition from abroad and uh, it, that is in the private sector or in the, in the, in the country itself, um, and thereby puts another uh, country uh, into a, into a, uh, uh, a position of, of uh, external control. Uh, I think there's just that this is part of, of, of Russian foreign policy uh, throughout the area, and uh, it should be uh, better understood as a new strategy, which also, uh, by the way, China would, w is using uh, in lots of places too. So it's something uh, that countries, are, the Western governments are going to have to think about. Thank you for pointing that out. Indeed, Rosatom um, now claims that um, it has 60 billion US dollars um, loaned to six countries for nuclear power plants. It has multiple projects all over the world. And it's a model um, that is very lucrative for um, the Russian government because it provides as a package together with nuclear plants, plans, sorry, um, training, military training and a military base. So um, that's, that's heavy cash income. And, and it's a model that uh, only state companies supported by states can pursue. Um, a similar model is, um, is in China. So Giselle, could you talk um, a little bit more about how um, China is interested in, 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 in these um, um, policies and what they are doing all over the world um, to, uh, to support um, their buying of um, energy and energy connections to Western countries? Um, yes, happy to do so. Thank you, Julia, for inviting me to uh, sit above my station here. Um, the Chinese are taking this Russian model of sort of finance, build, own, and operate, uh, and both scaling it up and uh, um, in sort of a typical Chinese way, uh, taking it to the nth degree as a model. Um, and their uh, um, infrastructure diplomacy, as you might call it, uh, extends beyond uh, the nuclear energy field. Uh, but it's also a great example of how uh, uh, China is using these projects um, as a way to exert its global influence, particularly through things like the Belt and Road Initiative or the 16 or 17 plus one, whatever the number currently is, uh, um, a strategy in Europe. Um, so you see um, the Chinese uh, 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 using energy projects and other kinds of interests and, and packaging these things together in a way that uh, is even more compelling than uh, the offers that uh, people can't refuse that come from, from Moscow. Um, and China is still a developing country itself, we have to remember, really uh, dependent on, on energy imports uh, through vulnerable sea lines of communication uh, and uh, stuck, at least for the near term, with 
a lot of coal plants that are uh, fouling the air all over China. China now gets about 1% of its energy from nuclear plants and plans within 15 years to bump that up to 35 or 40%. So they have an infrastructure of nuclear construction um, uh, that is substantial and is only going to grow. And I expect them to actually become the dominant player in this market, uh, even edging out the Russians using the similar playbook, but just with much with many greater resources and a more comprehensive uh, uh, plan and a more global plan. Thank you, Giselle. And, and let me turn to Ben um, and also weave in a little bit of the questions that we're getting in terms of the, of the risks and the um, safety measures um, for such projects and implemented already running plans um, all over um, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, in um, in Astraviets, I believe the project is 10 or 11 um, billion dollars. We have another loan given um, of um, by the Russian government with Rosatom to Hungary of 11 billion projects promising in Bulgaria as well as in Finland to be started um, uh, in, in the next few years. And finally in Turkey, um, the first nuclear power plant of Turkey built by Rosatom by Russia um, that was um, I think worth 20 billion dollars and they're planning to do more initially with the Japanese and then the, th uh, the third project with the Chinese back to um, what what uh, Giselle was discussing in the, in the longer term. So Ben, what can you tell us about um, safety measures and concerns in the region in this regard? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you, Yulia. And um, it's, it's great to be here at Johns Hopkins SICE, even, even if virtually. Um, I'm glad that we're talking about these topics today. And I'm glad that we're talking about cyber and physical security of energy infrastructure in particular, uh, because I think that we have to remember that when it comes to nuclear supply chains, um, we really have a major science and technology uh, impact of that um, in terms of, of, of dependencies. I, I, I'm a physicist by trade and, and just knowing how projects like, uh, like these operate, um, it, it's, it really does create that not only a, you know, an economic, you know, if you, if you look at uh, what, what you've described with Russia, it very much reflects the debt trap diplomacy models that China has, uh, has deployed throughout the world for you know, both energy and other critical infrastructure, and that includes through, through the 16 or 17 plus one initiative uh, along NATO's eastern flank. So, so that's something you have to, to remember. But let me just start by saying, without a doubt, one of the true European leaders, uh, when it comes to modeling the example of the core tenets of European energy security in terms of diversification, in terms of all of the, the things that we like to talk about, and you can already tell this from the minister's remarks, is Lithuania. So it's from supporting physical diversification of energy infrastructure projects like the Klaipa to LNG terminal and the gas interconnector pull into Lithuania, uh, to strengthening the EU's own core market liberalization legislation. It's strong support in, in continued legal challenges to ensure the third energy package or uh, uh, regulatory measures are deployed throughout the continent. And of course, supporting physical and cybersecurity of energy infrastructure, which is key to both civilian and national security resiliency. And, and that includes completing key electricity interconnectors like the Litpol link with Poland, the Nordbalt cable with Sweden. And, and through that, Lithuania has really demonstrated what it means uh, to take energy security seriously. And that's the, the reason I say that. That's why it's so important to take the concerns that leaders in Vilnius have had with Rosatom's Ostrovats nuclear power plant so seriously. It has had reports of safety concerns arising, uh, as the minister said, a number of times. I, I remember back uh, uh, to my own personal reaction, hearing that in 2016, there was an incident where news emerged that a crane had actually dropped a 330-ton heavy reactor core from four meters in height during a test lift. And that's obviously a major concern from a technical and engineering safety perspective um, that would carry through the lifetime operation of the power plant should it not be re uh, reviewed, mitigated, and resolved properly. Additionally, even after that news was published, Belarusian officials uh, resisted having a full IAEA uh, site and external events uh, design review known as the uh, full scope seed review. And it wasn't until Vilnius pressed this for a number of years that the IAEA was able to complete its review mission, uh, which of course I'd love to ask the minister to comment a bit more on the status of that review and, and how that, that came to take place last year. 
But let's step back for a second, especially in the context of the 1986 Chernobyl disaster, which impacted Belarus and, of course, the Baltic states as well, but Belarus so, um, so fundamentally, that led the initial plan for the Ostrovats nuclear power plant to be scrapped decades ago. So therefore, it remains puzzling why there has been this strong push from Rosatom to complete the project, which sits just 50 kilometers away from Vilnius and would have an outsized electricity capacity compared to the demand in that region of Belarus. Were this, were this project in Minsk, it'd be maybe a different question, but, but out in that region of, of Belarus, there's really no demand. Unless, unless, of course, the motivation is actually to project geopolitical influence over Belarus, uh, given the nuclear technology supply chain that I mentioned, the dependency that would last for not just a few years, but for decades. It's not just a cycle like in hydrocarbons, it it's, uh, sits there for decades. And also to export that excess electricity to the electricity grid of the Baltic states if it were able to, uh, in a bit of a, you know, a method to reverse the diversification trends that the Baltic countries have led in. It's also interesting, and I'll just kind of wrap up this opener with this and say that Russian disinformation narratives over the past several years have tried to cast the legitimate concerns uh, over physical security and geopolitical influence that have been raised by Vilnius is purely motivated by their own supposed mercantilist desire, quote unquote, uh, to dominate regional energy markets uh, with LNG imports uh, from the Klaipeda Independence Terminal, which is not surprising because this echoes the same narratives that we hear again and again from uh, gas prominence allies that have pushed in uh, have been pushed in an attempt to discredit U.S. national security concerns with Nord Stream 2 is quote unquote this mercantilist desire to sell its own LNG. So this is why it's as important as ever for Baltic countries to continue with their political and technical roadmaps with uh, Brussels and, and with uh, European uh, unity that would allow for electricity synchronization of their grids with the EU by 2025 and make the entire region not just you know more energy diverse but more physically resilient uh, and resilient to attempts for resurgent Russian influence via electricity in the coming years. So thank you all for this um, um, very nice and comprehensive from all of you, um, very short overview on, on what the security concerns and the challenges are at the moment for the region and for international security. And let's try for a moment um, to look into, uh, um, into the near and, and midterm future. Um, what what um, um, comes out of this discussion and, and of many others right now, and, and many of you during the, your first intervention have alluded to that is that Western interests in terms of energy security and diversification vary um, and there's different attitudes. The EU energy security um, has as its pr first priority diversification, but when we look at um, the efforts that have uh, have been done in terms of interconnectors and, and diversification of resources um, away from Russia, there's not as much uh, being done as, as could be, for sure. And um, different European, Western European countries, EU member states and NATO member states have different attitudes and different interests in terms of energy supply, many of them being dependent on much more cheaper and much cheaper gas um, uh, from, uh, um, from Russia than more expensive LNG that was part, part of the discussion and, and motivation behind Nord Stream 2, um, which is, uh, continues to be such a controversial um, topic for um, European security. Um, so if we are, are to be looking at um, Europe overall and, um, and the interests that, that sort of um, crystallize in terms of what EU strategy and EU priority should be in diversification and energy security, Albina, turning to you, um, how do you see that evolving um, in, the, in the next few months and years in terms of colliding interests or actually um, a shared interest, developing of shared interests that, that uh, would manage um, for the EU and its member states like Lithuania to have more security and more of a comprehensive and, and diverse um, energy resource? Well, thank you for this question, and uh, I think that I should start from the concept of whether the glass is half full or half empty, because it is obvious that if we speak about Europe 10, 15 years ago, the energy policy was considered as a purely national responsibility, and most of EU countries thought that EU has nothing to do with energy. Uh, today, we have already created energy union 
we have a third energy package which basically provides the basic conditions for competition in the energy field which provides uh, for diversification both uh, sources of supply and but also uh, the sorts of fuel that we are using and also routes through which we are getting energy into Europe and in that sense I guess uh, with the development of uh, LNG import capacity in Europe we now have significantly increased that capacity. There are quite a few terminals uh, being constructed right now. We also see development in LNG market that it can actually compete with the pipeline gas. Uh, Lithuania is a perfect example of that. We managed uh, to buy LNG cheaper than it's offered by Gazprom. And this is really welcome news. So I think that Europe is slowly recognizing that uh, energy dependence can be harmful for long-term economic uh, uh, prosperity and development. Uh, at the same time, of course, we are quite obsessed about climate change in Europe and you know that we are undergoing uh, quite a dramatic shift uh, from fossil fuels to, to renewables. That, of course, uh, also creates additional demand uh, for gas as a transitional fuel because uh, the, the fashion of the day is that we are moving from coal to less polluting fossil fuels. And also nuclear, in this sense, fighting climate change has a completely new role because uh, it doesn't emit CO2. So nuclear, in that sense, can be really attractive. So with the adoption of ener third energy package in 2009, I guess Europe has firmly started uh, the transition to more, towards more market-oriented uh, energy market and also towards uh, greater, greater energy security. We also have to admit that uh, Europe was investing heavily into infrastructure uh, there was an example mentioned that uh, the gas interconnected interconnector between Poland and Lithuania is being built uh, using EU money. And there are many other projects uh, in the field of energy security. Uh, for example, synchronization of Baltic states with Western European electricity grid is one of, one of them. And quite recently after protracted uh, negotiations, uh, EU managed to amend gas directive, which basically explained that EU regulation of third energy package is applicable also to pipelines that are coming from third countries. Of course, that gas directive uh, was uh, primarily targeted at certain uh, existing projects, uh, namely Nord Stream 2. And we also had uh, several developments in the last days. Uh, one of them was that German energy regulator refused to grant derogation for Nord Stream 2. And also that EU general court has dismissed on procedural grounds uh, claims of Gazprom against uh, amended uh, gas directive. So, you know, we are 27 countries with very differing interests. Uh, sometimes we are quite slow, but uh, the general perception and general feeling is that EU is strongly on the path of energy security. We are strongly on the path of receiving more LNG and strongly on the path of being uh, less dependent on Russia or any other dominant energy supply. Um, so when we look at the energy market in the next few years, it's clear that we have a lot of developments and that um, security energy becomes much more challenging year by year. Um, when we look at the last few years, in 2015, Russia launched a cyber assault on Ukraine's transmission system, um, electrical transmission system. In 2018, 
um, America's Department of Homeland Security said um, that there were concerns of um, spying um, in terms of, of um, um, Russian and, and Chinese at times um, attempts uh, in this market. Um, so we, we face more hybrid, more complicated challenges every day, um, both in Europe and in the United States and trying to formulate um, more diverse, uh, implement more diversification and formulate a more comprehensive, more secure strategy for energy procurement and energy security for the next few years. Um, Charles, yeah. you talked about the risks that are um, that are current. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you see the risks evolving in the next few years and what we need to look um, at in terms of trends and highlights um, to increase our security in, um, in, in terms of, of challenges and what comes ahead from, um, from uh, um, Russia, from China, from other players like that? Thank you. That's exactly the, the issue that I wanted to uh, go to. There are two ways in which um, Russia has very cleverly inserted itself uh, for the next number of decades. This plant, when it's in place, is supposed to uh, be able to provide uh, energy for uh, until 2050, and it might well be beyond that. Now, there are two arrangements involved here that ensure that Russia is going to be deeply involved in Belarus and have lots of influence over Lithuania and other countries as well. The first is it processes or will reprocess uh, the fuel. Uh, the question of how the w nuclear waste is dealt with is very ambiguous. I would say it's very confused, but they might have a role in that as well. So that's going to tie them in for a, a very long time in the future energy situation in Belarus. But the second issue is a direct political one. They have put in place a military, uh, I guess you'd call it installation base, right next to this plant uh, for purposes of, quote, uh, uh, security. But in addition, they put in um, uh, anti-aircraft uh, missiles and so on. I, I, I'm not sure against whom, but in any case, uh, in place. What that really means is Russia at any time can move its own forces into this area under the guise of trying to protect this plant. So if there were ever a better example of what neo-mercantilism is, as practiced both by Russia and China, I don't know what it would be. I mean, this is, this is the model. Um, and then going back to to balance out between um, Russia and China, um, Giselle, you know, Chinese nuclear technology together with 5G technology, <laughs> high speed railway um, technology are all at the root of technological power in China. As you mentioned before, they want to move to very few percent of dependence to 30, 35 percent. Um, nuclear power has made it into um, China 2025 goals. And um, uh, the president um, himself has, uh, the Chinese president has said that um, nuclear power is an important tool in fighting against global warming and pollution, which is subtext for um, uh, Chinese uh, increase in dominance in, in this area. Um, how do you see the Chinese um, threat in terms of nuclear um, energy and energy security, both in Europe and in the United States in the years to come? Well, um, um, if I can pick up on, to begin with on two of, of Charles's points, which I thought were exceptionally well taken. Um, one is that the die is cast for the next couple of decades. And what is true uh, in the Baltic states and in Eastern Europe um, is, is true and possibly even more so around the Indian Ocean um, and increasingly in maritime Southeast Asia uh, as well. And again, I would, I would stress that what is really driving the Chinese capacity here is its own domestic uh, requirements. So they're going to have a capacity that, that far exceeds, I think, uh, Russia's, and they have a global reach that, that the Russians uh, do not and, and will not. <laughs> but also, we're also shocked. It was like we just walked into Rick's American Bar in uh, Casablanca to find uh, gambling is going on. There's neo-mercantilism everywhere you turn. 
And we're still at that sort of uh, deer in the headlights moment. What if I can mix my metaphors terribly? Um, convincing ourselves that we need to put politics and security at the forefront of our energy policy and uh, our, our foreign policy more broadly, we still have the sort of end of history, um, uh, you know, afterglow about us. Uh, and, and we have, boy, to catch up to where the Russians and the Chinese have been uh, and are and are likely to be for the next couple of decades uh, will require a kind of collective action that uh, is, is kind of difficult to foresee, I'm afraid. Um, you're right, absolutely. So it's, it's a difficult task that we have ahead of us. And turning back to um, a little bit of the EU space and, uh, and Ben, um, head title, Ben, um, synchronization of, um, of the EU. And when we look at um, the, the different policies of major EU powers like Germany and France, they differ radically. While Germany has had, after Fukushima, no to nuclear, um, France has still a model um, that uh, of a state company uh, from Atom and is still pushing for nuclear energy. Um, how do you see all of this fitting in in terms of EU synchronization uh, on, on one side with EU um, bigger powers that have clearly a heavier say in whichever institutions of the EU they are um, with their leverage and, and their economic power, but on the other hand, Central and Eastern European states that are um, juggling be, um, between um, many of them, maybe Belarus is an exception, but many EU and NATO member states in Central and Eastern Europe would like to give um, to give Western um, energy um, uh, um, priority, but often cannot afford to. So how do you see all this picture fitting in? What, how do you see it in, in two or three years? What would um, energy security and energy synchronization look like in Europe? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think that um, you know, right out of the gate this year, we've seen a really surprising, maybe maybe surprising, maybe maybe it shouldn't be surprising, um, development in in terms of uh, Belarus itself. Uh, as as you know, we we know Belarus has been extremely dependent, up to ninety percent dependent on Russia for its um, its oil imports, its crude oil imports, um, and you know what we've seen in 2020 with Russia's uh, 2020 energy strategy is that the Kremlin has inverted uh, its long-standing um, oil for revenue, gas for influence scheme that we've uh, uh, seen it rely on to coerce its neighbors and create global turmoil for years. Um, but without having, uh, you know, projects like Nord Stream 2 coming online uh, due to EU regulatory action and, um, and, and U.S. Uh, targeted technology calibrated sanctions actions, which I'll talk about in a second, um, you know, we saw Russia kind of change its, its game plan um, for a few reasons with Belarus. In, in early January, Kremlin-controlled Transneft supplied oil deliveries, um, sorry, uh, suspended oil deliveries uh, to, to Minsk, um, which has been, as I said, almost fully dependent on the Russian Federation for crude imports. So doing this sort of hardball move was the climax, not of an energy specific move, but rather a geopolitical move. Moscow's increasing pressure campaign on Minsk uh, to form a political and economic union state with the Russian Federation uh, in a, uh, an arrangement on which uh, Kremlin insiders has, have long planned uh, to pin their hopes um, to try to solve the long lingering uncertainties associated with Putin's post-2024 uh, succession plan. So we saw that happen, and, and I think that that right away, you know, we have echoes of the um, Ukrainian gas cutoff by Gazprom in 2009, and then a number of other politically motivated cutoffs since then. But then this is this is happening in the oil sector, and for its part, Belarus and its president Alexander Lukashenko, who have long resisted any sort of arrangement for this um, this federation state. Um, and, and have uh, dealt with the country's heavy dependence on Russian oil, um, you know, even with notoriously insular and autocratic leadership uh, in Minsk, it, it appears to at least have learned some of the important lessons uh, from its non-Russian neighbors on energy diversification. You know, Ukraine, Poland, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia have all dealt with energy coercion from Putin's Kremlin, and Minsk rapidly signed deals uh, for oil imports 
from uh, from Norway in January from Azerbaijan um, in a in a certainly historic uh, move uh, that uh, crude was moved by Ukrainian pipelines oper operated by Ukra Transnafta in February, um, and then has just signed uh, a historic deal for U.S. oil exports uh, to Belarus just a few weeks ago. And because of this, Transnaft abandoned the cutoff, and, and then I think that some of the pressure has uh, been drawn down on this uh, federation state idea. Uh, unfortunately, Putin has used this, uh, uh, the pretext of COVID-19 to try to push forward a brute force path to simply reset the constitutional clock on term limits. So that's, um, that's another question. But um, I just want to, you know, I want to just point out um, that, again, you know, when, when the minister mentions um, some of these uh, EU regulatory actions that have taken place, uh, I have to say the, the May 2020 rulings by both Germany's Bundesnetzagentur and the EU General Court, which denied Gazprom's attempts to circumvent EU regulations um, on, on Nord Stream 2, should be commended. They absolutely should be commended, but vigilance is required to be maintained because Gazprom is now likely to attempt to deploy a legal contingency scheme to appear to comply with the gas directive without being subject to the ended, intended impact of the law. The idea potentially is uh, creating this legal fiction where you would have an, uh, a spot trading point on the Baltic seabed for um, for Russian gas, and, and that just that just doesn't work out. Um, so these rulings should not be viewed in some sort of uh, you know sense that it's a compromise and, and that things uh, are are all looking good on the Nord Stream two side. The Kremlin may attempt a number of technical maritime configurations to resume construction of Nord Stream two, um, but those U.S. NDAA sanctions um, have have thus far stopped this from happening. And I think the threat of an SDN designation to Gazprom or one of its subsidiaries could be a determinant for the economically hard hit Gazprom, which reported its first quarterly loss in history, uh, to think twice about resuming the physical construction because the global financial crimes compliance sector is highly risk averse. And Western companies may ultimately decide that the entire Nord Stream 2 pipeline enterprise is simply too radioactive uh, to continue any future business with the project should it continue. So, all of these things uh, go together and um, certainly in the context of NATO's eastern flank nations uh, and, um, and eastern uh, states of, of the uh, EU, um, you know, it's, it's part and parcel and core to shifting energy diversification trends um, that really just need to be, uh, to be held in, in, um, in the, the front of the national security priorities of, of all of these governments. Thank you. Um, and let's let's try um, for the time that we have remaining to weave in um, and, and uh, touch upon as many questions as um, we we can uh, among the already um, uh, several that were sent and, and very interesting. Thank you all for sending um, your questions in and please continue to do so. We'll try to address as many as we can. Um, the first question maybe to you, Albinas. Um, are there any international economic and politi or political penalties for countries building and running nuclear reactors that are of questionable safety and in violation to international um, uh, nuclear energy agreements like the one in Astraviets. Are you aware of any or is there anything um, that can be done more in terms of penalties and international law and regulations in, in these cases? Well, thank you for this question. Well, I wish I knew one, but uh, as far as I know, there are no penalties and no sanctions for violating uh, nuclear safety. And the to be very honest, we have a problem with International Atomic Energy Agency. I mean, Ben mentioned the seed mission of the uh, Belarusian nuclear power plant that was conducted by International Atomic Energy Agency. But the difficulty with that mission is that it covered only part of the scope we need. And uh, we tried to communicate why people uh, in the International Atomic Energy Agency didn't even consider the site selection. Because the first difficulty we have with that nuclear power plant is that it is built on the wrong place where there is a seismic activity. And the answer from the uh, international body was that, look, uh, the construction is already taking place. So there is no reason to consider whether the site is right or not. So this is the real situation with the responsibility about uh, breaching nuclear safety. And I think that uh, we need, you know, 
uh, international community to be more vocal about that because uh, you know it allows the, the current international governance structure allows irresponsible nuclear conducting. That's a very bad precedent. So um, we have several questions as I'm looking through them on what the U.S. can do. Um, one is um, what sort of U.S. assistance um, to the Astrovitz NPP uh, would mitigate some of Lithuania's concerns, if any, and um, what can generally the U.S. do to help in these cases? And um, as as um, I don't know, this this question is quite general. I would like. Um, Charles and Giselle, whoever wants to take this up and, uh, and uh, tell us what can the U.S. do at this extent, because uh, from my knowledge, it's um, the, the U.S. capacity of intervention in, in, such a case is, in such a case is quite limited. So um, to both of you, um, what are, uh, in your um, understanding, the measures, um, uh, whether diplomatic or technical or any kind of support that the United States with its policy of promoting LNG for um, EU energy diversification away from Russian dependence, which is happening in cases like Astrovietz right now, just like in Hungary and in, in, in Turkey and perhaps in Bulgaria and in, in the near future. Um, what can the U.S. do um, to mitigate, mitigate these risks and help its allies in Europe? Well, I, I'm, this might be a little facetious, but I think the best thing it could do is to develop a much cheaper battery, which can be used for uh, uh, lots of uh, in lots of places uh, in solar, uh, and will uh, itself have an effect here. I, I would just say this: I think there's a mythology, and I think uh, you, know, I might have di might disagree a little with what you said at one point. There's a mythology that what uh, China and uh, and uh, Russia are doing is uh, profit making, that, there, that this is going to lead to uh, economic returns. I don't have the numbers in front of me, maybe Ben does, but I have to say I don't think there's much profit here. This is exactly a, a foreign policy program of uh, intervention and continuing influence uh, out, uh, emanating from Moscow or in, in other cases from, from Beijing. Uh, it's not about profits. If, if it were about profits, the project would never have been made. The only way this thing could have make any sense at all is if they could sell a huge amount of their electricity uh, to Lithuania. Now, there undoubtedly some interest there would like to buy it, but whether that, uh, that it looks to be, uh, that's pretty much foreclosed, at least formally, officially at this point. Uh, so this is not about profits. This is a foreign policy uh, project to obtain Russian influence. Giselle, you're on mute. There we go. There we go. The, the mute button is always elusive. Um, look, uh, again, Charles is exactly right. Uh, nobody, nobody on Wall Street's buying shares in the Belt and Road Collective or in these things. <laughs> um, but that's exactly the point. A, a strategic move, a geopolitical move, requires a similar response. Um, we cannot count on the profit motive or a private industry to, uh, to be an adequate uh, comeback in these cases. I would say there are four things. And, and so we need to be, this requires government, not only American government, but international allied Western government action. Batteries would be great, but also, uh, it, you know, regarding al alternative energy sources uh, uh, that aren't tied to uh, exports by adversaries uh, is, is clearly a long-term strategic investment. It's also good for the environment and all the rest of that stuff, we hope, although batteries are not so good when you have to get rid of them. Um, uh, but also things like subsidizing the LNG uh, uh, import and export uh, um, infrastructure, making sure that American fracked oil uh, uh, remains competitive, and we see now, you know, now when uh, energy prices go down, uh, many of the fracking companies are driven out of business. I mean, so that makes, you know, 
we try to make a profit, but our adversaries don't care about profits. So that's an asymmetry we need to deal with. Um, I would be happy to even because maybe the French nuclear industry is the only thing that's left that you could actually throw money at, you know, offering uh, for those countries uh, who are attracted to nuclear energy, um, you know, uh, uh, American, you know, and European backing uh, through uh, French suppliers uh, could be a good strategic response. So there's, there are three or four things that we could do in the near term and then looking to try to get back uh, ahead on the renewables front um, and things like, like energy storage and the energy grid uh, too. Um, but that's going to require government intervention. We can't require, uh, you know, rely entirely on private investment uh, to, to be sufficient because they will want a return on that investment. They all want profit, that's right. Um, and, and before my turn with my uh, a question that we received and I'd like to um, address to Ben, just um, one quick example that I'd like to frame this in. Um, another um, case of such a nuclear plant with, with discussions on who to invest in that feeds well into can the West invest because they do not have the same model as Russia and China and, and perhaps France in, in terms of state backing of state companies um, that are uh, that are um, specialized in um, in nuclear energy. Um, uh, Romania, um, a bit south of, of um, Central and Eastern Europe, has one nuclear plant that has been finalized with two reactors in 2007 with the help of a Canadian company because Romania is a US strong ally opted for Western in involvement and they wanted to develop it into um, to into building two extra reactors. Now they've tried to set a few years ago the government um, a consortium of, of Western companies to invest in, uh, in it and within three years all these um, um, investment companies um, retracted their offer because it just wasn't profitable enough. So trying to scramble for a second solution, the, the um, Romanians turned to the Chinese and, and closed a deal with them um, for, for two nuclear reactors that then last year was vetoed um, uh, due to pressure from the United States. And because of course Romania had wanted um, a different option, so they were willing to, to cancel it this year as a reaction to, to um, the Trump administration's pressure last year um, on this with a memorandum of understanding and all of that. Now the situation is becoming exactly the same in Romania as it, as it is in other cases that um, countries are uh, need foreign investments because they do not have the capacity to do so. But in the end, Canada or the United States might not be interested their companies in, in pushing for such a profit, in pushing in, uh, or investing into such a project because there's just not enough profit. They have a different business model than um, Russia and China. So that leads me, long story short, to the question um, for Ben because he's very familiar with these things. We have a question um, that says, uh, that is um, related to um, the competition between the West um, and, and the East um, as to how to decide if um, the West is willing to bet on nuclear energy. Those projects that are expensive and long term um, in order to compete with a very attractive model finance build one operate model, um, the West has to commit to that. But now in the EU, the nuclear um, uh, sorry, the nuclear is under question. Russia is taking a bet on nuclear energy, but maybe it will lose money. Do you think that um, nuclear energy is important to the United States? Yeah, I, I, I do. And, and I think that this comes back to what both Charles and Giselle said. Uh, I'll just build on that and say that um, we don't need, you know, we are going up against, you know, we being the West in, in, in the United States, are going up against um, state-owned enterprises from both Russia and, and China. And, and I absolutely don't think that the solution is creating uh, an America Atom or a, a America Neft or America Prom, right? It's, it's, it's not, um, it's not what, what our government should be, um, should be involved in. However, increasing basic research funding 
for nuclear energy technologies and renewables uh, throughout the entire value chain and including uh, grid scale battery storage will help mitigate some of these uh, these concerns and and you know American enterprises have been able to uh, out innovate uh, these state owned enterprises in in a lot of cases because of basic technology innovation that has come from our national labs, for example. So, so we need to keep that in mind and keep funding science uh, at, at, a, at a large scale because that's what's going to keep um, American competitiveness both in uh, renewables and nuclear energy technologies and future uh, energy technologies like, like fusion. I've, I've worked in fusion in the past um, uh, at the start of my career. So, so those have to be, um, have to be held in, in high regard. Um, I think that it's, it's pretty clear, as Charles said, you know, these sort of projects um, aren't just, you know, it's not just a commercial deal. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, for example, gas pro uh, projects, um, there's, there's a uh, 2018 spare bank analysis that pointed out that gas problems investments in projects like Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream are in fact very uh, significantly value destructive for its shareholders. And Nord Stream 2, for example, would take at least 20 years to become profitable and Turk Stream an incredible 47 years to break even. So that, that goes throughout the entire energy investment chain when, you, when it comes to Russian state-owned enterprises abroad. It's not for uh, you know, basic uh, commercial market reasons. It's for spreading influence and, and uh, malign influence and elite capture and, and all the things that we're concerned about today. And I, I do want to point out the United States has uh, taken action this year in, in addition to its, um, its, its policy support. Uh, there was a pledge uh, back in February for $1 billion from the United States to help uh, Europe reduce its energy dependence on the Russian Federation um, uh, that was specifically focused on uh, funding, basically creating a fund for energy diversification projects um, like, uh, like, you know, the grid scale electricity synchronization, for example, of the Baltic states, which is, as I said, is very important for um, the strategic security of the region. So um, I think that those sort of coupled actions, domestic research funding and creating these funds for, um, for our partners and allies are, are really important and vital to uh, both their national security and, and our, our national security, transatlantic security writ large. Thank you, Ben. Um, I've been asked a question for you um, from, from our um, participants. Don't you think that the only incentive for Russia to keep Baltic states synchronously connected um, with um, Russia is in the interest of trading of electricity? And what would happen if Baltic states would stop full trade of electricity with Russia and Belarus. Um, now um, that is um, five years before desynchronization with Russia in 2025 is planned. Um, would Russia try to revenge by disconnecting Baltic states? Uh, that's a very good question. I, I mean, the synchronization of Baltic states uh, electricity grid to the Western Europe is a long-term project. It uh, comes in stages and uh, the finalization of this project is foreseen by 2025. And that uh, uh, term of 2025 is uh, based uh, on a certain technical requirements for the stability of the grid. And we still need to build one major undersea cable from Poland to Lithuania before uh, uh, before synchronization project can be not only uh, safe but also economically viable. Uh, of course, uh, we were asking ourselves those questions. Uh, what would happen if Russia uh, tries to disconnect uh, Baltics or would try to revenge um, uh, against us? Uh, uh, we made a certain uh, uh, stress test on our electricity grid and we are pretty sure that there wouldn't be a blackout. We are pretty sure that we can survive and operate but the price of electricity in the short term would increase. Mm -hmm. So for the price of electricity to be stable we still need one more connection with Poland. But uh, if that connection is built, I think we are fully ready to uh, synchronize by 2025. 
without any major economic implication. We are in a very competitive region. We have uh, abundant electricity resources in Scandinavia, a lot of uh, hydro energy, but also uh, nuclear energy in Sweden. And those power plants are old, so uh, their capital expenditure is already very low. So they are much more competitive than uh, the newly built uh, Astrovets nuclear power plant. And for Belarus, it will be extremely difficult to compete in the Lithuanian market. If they, even if, if they were allowed to do that, but you know, Lithuania has a law uh, where Parliament states unanimously, uh, that is uh, agreement by all political parties, that we are not buying electricity from the nuclear installations that are not safe. And I think it would be really a political suicide to try to amend that law. So basically, uh, we are doing our best to survive any scenario. And uh, once we build undersea cable, uh, from uh, Poland to Lithuania, we are just fine. Thank you, Albinas. Um, and, and let me uh, turn to Charles with a bit of a more difficult and general questions regard question regarding the United Nations. United Nations demand regarding energy um, infrastructure to go out um, from the use of fossil fuel, gas and coal to renewables. How do you evaluate the chances to install renewables? And is there any dependence uh, on Russia, the United States or China um, to um, support, I believe in Europe, they refer to, um, uh, to support energy renewable projects and, and diversification and development in Europe? Well, there's no doubt that the only justification, at least in my mind, for nuclear is that it doesn't pollute in terms of uh, gases, of uh, greenhouse gases type. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, that's not a very good uh, uh, justification for uh, nuclear power from plants that quite obviously have safety problems associated with it. I mean, I can understand totally why people living in Lithuania and probably in Belarus too, are extraordinarily worried about what's going to happen over the, if not to them, to their children, in terms of uh, an accident in one of these plants. And, and so that is going to, in some ways, unfortunately, a major disaster is likely to have more of effect on the uh, spread of this kind of uh, inferior technology and nuclear terms than perhaps anything else. Um, the general, there's nothing that the UN uh, can do or other organizations of this sort can do to encourage um, uh, some uh, friendlier uh, energy for, uh, in terms of the environment. But what can affect this is the kind of thing that Ben's involved in, and that is serious research that lowers costs uh, for everybody, essentially, over time, and that, and particularly allows our firms to take lead of money as well. So I think that is that's that's what we should look forward to: uh, more money. Let me give you the bottom line: more money in the United States for serious alternative energy research, not development, but research. If I could get a quick. Uh, to figure because we've uh, there's another theme that we might have mentioned and uh, I think has run throughout a number of comments and that is the uh, uncertainties that we face in a whole host of international bodies. Um, certainly, the WHO experience during the coronavirus crisis. Um, I'm not sure whether that means we should walk away from all these uh, organizations. Um, but, um, or whether it's best to sort of try to combat uh, subversive influence by the Russians or the Chinese or, or whomever, uh, but to rely on the international organizations that we currently have and as they currently stand um, is, is uh, possibly uh, uh, introducing a new level of risk uh, as well. 
And, and one more, uh, one or two more questions to you from participants that I'd like to to switch between um, Russia and China because you, Giselle, have a, a view on on both of them. Um, one question is regarding the contracts that Russia signed um, of more than one hundred billion. That's actually false. It's sixty billion. Uh, but but nevertheless, how much of this can Russia in in I'd like to add China in their investments can afford to finance especially given lower um, oil prices. And then um, uh, um, how do you see um, these things in the next few years in terms of, um, of uh, BRI and, and what um, China is uh, offering, but we know that often cannot afford um, in the model that they've had so far is to buy up, unlike um, the Russians who are developing because they have still the capacity, um, China has um, at the beginning copied Russian models of, of um, um, reactor um, technology and, and now is building it at home mostly and then expanding towards Asia. Asia, whereas in Europe, is actually trying to, to buy whatever is already there um, to have a, um, a, a foot in, in the door in terms of finance and, and political leverage. So. Um, can um, Russia and China afford these projects? Is it viable? And, and what are the implications then for us? Well, I, the short answer would be that uh, I, I doubt the Russians' ability to do more than they're already doing and their long-term prospects are not great. And this, I would say, is one of the real things that distinguishes China from Russia is the uh, both the uh, amount of resources that they have to bring to the table and the fact that they have a much more diversified and uh, internationally viable economy. This is uh, something that uh, Russia and the Soviet Union certainly never had. So um, uh, China's, and of course, we don't know what's going on behind the curtain in Beijing uh, all that well. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, uh, they sir, are throwing a lot of money uh, at the Belt and Road Initiative and in the coronavirus crisis during a time where their uh, own economic growth has slowed, uh, you know, sort of uh, quite dramatically. Uh, they see this as an opportunity to expand their, their reach. Uh, and uh, I don't think we should count on the Chinese running out of money anytime soon. <laughs> Um, ben, a question for you um, from one of our participants um, that you mentioned the role of U.S. national labs in supporting technology and providing a competitive advantage. Um, could you expand on this topic? Are there any efforts at labs either to align nuclear energy with storage or advanced reactor research um, that you are aware of and we should be aware of? And should labs be looking at broader partnerships internationally. Yeah, and I, I think that that's, uh, that's really key to, um, you know, to the success of large scale, you know, big, what we call big science and when it comes to, to, to basic science and basic research. What Charles said is absolutely right. There's a difference between development of, uh, of these technologies for, you know, commercial deployment and, um, and the ability of basic research to actually make those fundamental steps in, in the underlying science that can get us to that, uh, to that level. So to that extent, I mean, we've seen this with large scale physics projects uh, the world over. There, there's a reason that the superconducting super collider uh, back in the 90s failed when we tried to do that unilaterally, but you know, CERN, the, the Large Hadron Collider succeeded um, because we had that, um, that ability for the US to be a leader within multinational research fora um, and and in in international organizations that support um, cooperation in 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 research. Um, so I think that we need to uh, continue to um, expand our presence in those uh, those those science organizations, um, and then really have a, a return. Unfortunately, in you know this administration has deprioritized. Um, you know, basic science uh, to, to some extent, but we need to have a return to that, um, you know, as quickly as possible, because that is what's really key to American leadership, both economically and in terms of uh, getting us to a clean energy future, 
Um, and, and I don't mean just with, uh, with renewable, you know, standard renewables, hy you know, hydro, um, uh, 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 solar and, um, and wind, but to get to these future, you know, what I call horizontal energy technologies, um, like, you know, a thermonuclear fusion reactor um, that's being developed in the south of, uh, of France called ITER, the International Thermonuclear uh, Experimental Reactor. Um, you know, it's often said that, that fusion, right? So, so the idea is, you know, unlike, unlike uh, civil nuclear, um, which has a supply chain that uh, generates large scale um, nuclear waste, uh, fusion has the potential of bringing lighter elements um, you, know, you know, things like, like deuterium and tritium, bring those together and without large scale nuclear waste, um, having, uh, you know, having a, a major return on, on investment in terms of, you know, creating, uh, you know, power for the poor, so to speak. Um, but even on a no holds barred fast track, such as we saw, you know, the funding environment during the Apollo program, it would still take, you know, a few decades uh, for, um, for uh, fusion to become a reality. Um, that that we can really rely on is a base load that um, uh, that you know a mix between uh, you know the quote unquote traditional renewables uh, grid scale energy storage and then having fusion as a base load but that's that's the future that that's decades uh, from now but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be significantly investing in these sort of technologies right now because that's going to be key for um, for you know getting us to uh, combat climate change in in the coming years. But also uh, make, make make sure that we have U.S. leadership uh, and Western leadership for uh, basic, you know, fundamental energy technologies that we're going to need uh, down the road. Thank you all. And and to wrap up um, before we close this very interesting discussion, um, I I still have we still have uh, plenty of questions, but I'm afraid um, with time constraints we cannot address all of them. I'll just put out um, two or three keywords, and uh, I'd like all of you um, to to uh, um, just um, add a few things, whatever you would like um, to add to this discussion that maybe you haven't had a chance to touch upon, or you would like to reemphasize briefly. And if you want to um, touch on, on one of these things that, that have come up um, with the questions. Um, one of the key words was um, India uh, with its nuclear energy development, what role it can play in, in uh, international um, security of energy. Um, the second one was related to um, France that we mentioned several times because they have a different model of um, a nuclear energy company that is more state um, back than, than other business models in the West and, and how can they help and what role can, can they play um, in, in this context. And then um, the last thing was related um, to um, Baltic states um, in, in, with regard to cooperation on energy as each one of these states has um, different um, priorities in terms of energy partially overlapping with each other but partially not. So how can um, a cooperation among them be increased to, to uh, um, um, create an extra weight on, on in terms of um, Baltic um, Baltic Sea security and energy security in the region. Um, so whatever you want to touch upon, or if you want to touch upon um, some things that you um, that you you in in different contexts of our discussion would have wanted to mention, um, and and maybe last words so we can wrap this discussion up. Uh, Agnes, would you like to go first, or Charles? Yeah, Charles? yeah I'll, I'll, I will just take a crack at this. Uh, it seems to me that as we look decades ahead, uh, the greatest energy-related concern is the production of enormous amounts of carbon dioxide, uh, to some lesser extent, uh, uh, methane and so on. Um, and the two countries that are going to produce most of this I think as their populations get richer and become part of middle, middle class will be China and India. So they're really the key in protecting the environment. And they at this point are very growth oriented and uh, the environmental issues are, take a second seat, even though they pretend that's not the case. Now, it seems to me that if the route that they're going to take to try to protect the environment is to build shoddy nuclear plants, that is a really high risk, dangerous approach that is gonna have consequences, not just for them, but for others for a couple hundred years at least. 
uh, if there's an accident. So I think the key is to get them on the right path uh, through the benefits of the research that uh, Ben has been talking about here. Uh, and, uh, and Giselle has uh, really uh, articulated well for us. And I think that this is, this is something that we have to think about. Let's not encourage in any way shoddy development of nuclear facilities as somehow a quick fix uh, with the cover that it's going to be beneficial to our environment. Um, who, Albinas, would you like to go next? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much and thank you for organizing this uh, meeting. I think I will touch upon a little bit on, on the Baltic region and uh, I think that there's a misconception that uh, we think differently there. I, I mean, Baltic countries were the front runners when we needed to destroy Soviet Union and we did that. And we have unprecedented level of cooperation in all fields, including in energy. And I guess those small differences that we have can be easily overcome if, uh, let's say, format of three Baltic states plus US uh, was repeated once again in, in, in the framework of PTEC initiative. We already had one meeting, it was instrumental in. Uh, you know, uh, agreeing on, on common position. I think that U.S. involvement would really help us to find a common view towards our energy security. But my last remark uh, will be that uh, in order to really become uh, energy independent, we need that Western world, the democratic world, develops new technologies. And I am convinced that in a free democratic world, where talent is free, where talent can show itself, uh, we will be able to also show our technological supremacy. Thank you. No. Um, uh, not to be a party pooper, uh, but uh, I'm, and Ben in particular makes me optimistic about the, about the longer term, but I'm really concerned about the near term. Um, I think we're behind the eight ball, have been falling behind the eight ball, I love mixing metaphors, uh, for the last 20 or 25 years. And so we do need a near term stopgap strategy. Um, and I, I would agree with Charles that cheapo uh, polluting uh, nuclear plants are. Uh, uh, are not the answer, neither are coal plants. Um, but, uh, and maybe LNG as a bridge to uh, the future that Ben uh, and Charles suggest um, is, is the way to go, or maybe there are other routes, but we need a coherent plan that gets us from where we are now, and we need to be realistic about where we are now, uh, to, to the kind of future that, that uh, Ben has been uh, uh, suggesting uh, we need to walk into gum at the same time. So Ben, we all refer to you and your expertise. Any um, last insights and words for our participants and for us? I'll switch it around. I, I appreciate Charles and, and Albinus and Giselle for um, for you know valuing and, and supporting the uh, the importance of, of basic uh, you know U.S. research and international cooperation in, in science and in particular physics research in, uh, for in this case. Um, but I, I'll, I'll flip it around and agree with um, what all three of them in, uh, have said. You know, Giselle pointed out quite rightly um, in our international institutions um, we have a lot of uh, uh, Russian and Chinese influence that's projected through uh, infrastructure development. You know, whether it's uh, you know transportation or telecommunications, um, but uh, you know, and also of course in energy, whether it's nuclear energy or or other energy sources. Um, and you know, I don't think the solution is obviously with withdrawing from those organizations, but rather just continuously and robustly working with our partners and allies um, to double down our engagement and ensure that um, you know any malpractice that that would, for example. Um, limit the international community's ability to address safety concerns or address 
um, you know, address these uh, geopolitical concerns with with uh, energy and critical infrastructure investment um, are are understood. Um, and that's the only way that that the U.S. Um, and its European partners and allies are ever going to really start to um, sort out uh, the trends of of Russian and Chinese um, malign influence and elite capture, um, both in the energy sector and and writ large, because we can't adequately address our gravest national security challenges, whether it's through you know great power competition or um, or any other geopolitical model without that sort of international cooperation um, and clear-eyed understanding of, of what's so important to our, our shared strategic security. Uh, Julia, can I do a footnote? I, I think that, uh, uh, I agree with the co comments of all of my colleagues here, but I think Albinus really concluded on the right note. And that is, don't lose confidence in this terrible, uh, uh, virus problem, for example, don't lose confidence in democracy and in uh, the market approach, uh, which is the most efficient approach and provides the most benefits to the most people. The combination of that is something that will get us through, but we can't lose any con our confidence in this. Uh, in sort of temporarily being attracted to uh, solutions that turn out to be very flawed. Charles, I couldn't have said it uh, better. I will, I will close the panel without adding to, to uh, your words because um, it expressed, I think, exactly our views, that we have a lot of challenges in front of us, um, that we have challenging powers um, that are questioning our ability to, um, to have a good, reliable science that citizens trust um, for their safety and for their security, whether it's energy or um, defense or economy or the coronavirus. Um, so um, this is the most important thing that we should, we should stuck with, um, the, the expertise that we benefit from um, that is targeted on citizens and individuals to offer security and, and prosperity. Um, thank you all. I cannot thank you enough for joining, for taking the time. Our panelists, I am privileged to have been able to host this discussion with all of you. Um, I think our discussion was more than interesting. I, I hope um, it was a benefit for our participants as well. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of the questions we did our best to do um, to, to get in and weave in as many as possible. Um, thank you again also FPI Sites for hosting us, my home and, and um, Charles's uh, Sites home as well. Um, quick um, shout out and thanks to Jason who is not visible to the discussion but who has been key to helping us um, set it together um, uh, technologically. It's been a great opportunity to be able to engage with both sides of the Atlantic through this Zoom. Um, again, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.